Hi, welcome to The Red Booth Show. On tonight's episode, I have Carrie Kasem. She's a TV personality and a radio host, and she's also the daughter of Casey Kasem. And we talk about a very important bill regarding elder care. So come and join us. So hi, Carrie. Well, hello. Thank you for coming on my show. Absolutely. I just wanted to tell you that I really loved your press conference. And I would love for you to kind of like let everybody know what's going on. You know, what's the story and the, the whole thing, the bill, all of it. Well, first of all, thank you for coming and supporting me. That really meant a lot to me. That was amazing. Um, and the reason why we are out there uh, doing a press conference is because we about eight months ago went to the police and said, this is what happened to my dad. You know, this is what these were the circumstances that led up to his death. And we believe this person's responsible for it. And they sat on the case. They, they, you know, the, the first detective that took a look at it in Santa Monica said, you have a case here. This looks like elder abuse to me. And, uh, he did a really good thorough job. And, um, unfortunately it had to transfer because of jurisdiction issues to the West LA police department. They don't have an elder abuse unit there and elder I'm, abuse is a specialty. It really is. People don't yeah. understand it. And, and the detective that was working on it before was an elder abuse. And that's it was his specialty. So they sat on it for months and months and months, not doing anything, hoping it would just go away and it's not going away. And yeah. me and my family are not going to say, Oh, okay, well, you know, we'll just put it to rest and thanks guys for nothing. That's just not, that's not my family. Of course not. And I mean, in case you guys don't know, this is Carrie Kasem and her father is Casey Kasem, who was a, a very, very well-known radio DJ, radio host. And um, he also was an activist too. I mean, he went out yep. there and fought for all sorts of things. So he did. He was a human rights activist. He was an animal activist. Um, you know, he, he fought for what he believed in, even if it wasn't popular. You know, even if it wasn't what the masses wanted and, and he felt it was wrong, or he sometimes was the underdog. And that's kind of what I feel like I'm doing for him now. It's, uh, and I'm, you know, a lot of people know the story already, but you know, my father, uh, we were blocked from seeing my dad, oh, a year before he died, maybe a little more. And, uh, and we knew this was gonna happen because my, I don't even like to say my stepmother, but his wife, had done this to her own mother with her own siblings, you know, had blocked her own siblings from seeing her mom when she was sick. They didn't, she was not, um, she did not tell her siblings when her mom was in the hospital or when she died. <gasps> so we knew this was coming. So, what a terrible person. Yeah, it, 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 was a, it was a horrible thing. So we had talked to my dad almost every single day on the phone. My dad would call us every single day until he really lost his voice and the ability to talk. Right, what was the disease that he had? Um, it was called Lewy Bodies Dementia. Mm. Um, it mimics Parkinson's. So a lot of people, when, we, when, when he first got the diagnosis in 2007, it was Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. So uh, we thought it was Parkinson's, but he kept having kind of more dementia with it. Mm. And, and then years later, it was Lewy Bodies Disease. But we were kept from all of his doctor's records. We were not allowed to go to his doctors. We were not allowed to actually, in the last couple of years of his life, know what was going on with him. She blocked everything. And my sister... I'm so surprised that's even, like, possible. Like, you would think that that's illegal, but... No, it's not. It's not. And that's why I'm working so hard with, you know, the California legislator and legislation and uh, with legislators and trying to f create this bill, which I'll talk about in a minute, that would stop a lot of this abuse and a lot of this um, isolation. So uh, going, going back... When this happened, when this happened to us, we kind of knew it was coming because she had done that to her own mother. My dad, when he got the diagnosis, um, signed over a durable power of health to my sister, who's a physician's assistant, and um, what she practices is end of life care, palliative care. Wow. And her husband is a cardiologist at UCLA. And my dad ran every single thing he took by them. Always. Is this medicine okay? Should I take this? What should I be doing? But when his voice really, the last couple of years of his life, it was very hard for him to talk, very hard. He could say little things here and there, but it was very hard for him to talk. And when that was gone, um, How did she, he communicate after that? He could, he could like, you know, say little things here and there, but he really, when you were trying to explain something to him, he could get one or two sentences, and after that it was, his brain wouldn't process it. Right. Yeah, but um, he never 
didn't know who we were. He always know he always knew who we were. He always, you know, um, would say, I love you. And, 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 you know, we would hug him and he would sit with us and he could nod and he could smile and we would all have wonderful family time together. But that was cut short when he was too sick to get out of bed and to move and to say, uh, please drive me to my, my, you know, my, uh, my sister, I'm sorry, my, either my, we went to my sister's house mostly, my sister Julie. So he, when he said, you know, please take me, she'd fired his driver. She had fired everybody that worked with him. Anybody that would call us, she would fire. So she isolated him completely. And yeah, it, it got... How did she like justify that? I mean, there must have been... Like, that's just crazy. I don't even understand. I know. It happens. This isn't just like my story. Like It's almost like she people. wants him to die or something, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, I think so. I mean, she had a boyfriend of two years. She had moved her boyfriend into the house her boyfriend was driving my dad's car, living in my dad's house, and my dad was placed in different um, hospitals around uh, town. And in fact, she'd dump him off there. And the reason why I know this now is when I got temporary conservatorship of my dad, and we're kind of bouncing around a little bit, but when I got temporary conservatorship of my dad, I got to see all the medical records. And many hospitals in the LA area had called Adult Protective Services because she wouldn't pick him up. <gasps> she'd drop him off and leave him there because she was off with her boyfriend here. And, didn't was a hassle for her so the the um, that's so disgusting yeah it was it was hor- horrible we knew what was going on we knew what was happening and so um when we kept asking her to see him at, for a month it went on to two months by the time it hit the third month i remember that yeah we i were did. like talking about it online a lot and saying we're trying to get to see him and yeah yeah talking about it and you know i started talking about it on the radio and i said yeah this is a horrible thing and we did a protest outside of my father's house. And it wasn't just me and my brother and my sister, it was everybody she had blocked from seeing my dad. Everybody that had seen him, had been able to call him, had been able to communicate with him. She was blocking every single person my dad loved, including his own brother, his aunts, his cousins, all of his friends. He had three friends that he went to Wayne State with. They knew each other for 64 years. Though all of them were blocked. The creative American Top 40 with my dad, Tom Rounds was blocked. I was blocked, my sister was blocked, my my brother was blocked. Everybody that my dad knew, he was being isolated from everybody. So I thought, okay, if we stand out there and say, we're not gonna take this anymore, Jean, let us see our father. This is not okay. You know, that maybe she'd go, okay, well, I, I don't wanna get in trouble here. Let's, let's arrange visiting time again. Never happened. We went to court. My, um, unfortunately we had lawyers that didn't understand what they were dealing with and oh, no. they kept saying, this is the best you're going to get. This is the best you're going to get. That was 20 minute visits once a month with a guard in the room. No, no, uh, no electronics so no phone. We couldn't bring in pictures. It was in one, we, we couldn't go in all together. And I said, I'm not signing that. I'm not going to be treated like a, like a criminal. My dad's not an inmate. I'm not signing this. My brother and sister signed it. I said, I'm going to fight for conservatorship. Um, so the minute they signed it, she reneged on all of it. She moved him and hid him in different places. So TMZ actually found him at, um, convalescent hospital. Wow. Yeah. It called us and said, this is where your dad is. Oh my God. So they TMZ went, did some good, good they stuff. They did some there. good stuff. They did some good <laughs> stuff. They've actually been kind to us. So, That's awesome. yeah. So we, we found him there and, uh, and she wouldn't let us in. So I found a lawyer, um, Martha Patterson, who knew all the elder elder laws, everything said, if if your father is moved out of the house into a hospital or convalescent home, because he said in court loud and clear to the judge, I want to see my children over and over again, not just once, but over and over again, I want to see my children because he stated that publicly, they have to let you in. And I didn't know this. And most people don't know this, that if they are outside of a home, and not with the primary caretaker or the guardian, the conservator, the wife, if they've been put in a home and they say, I want to see this person, that home has to let you see that person. Good. They can't stop. Right. So we got in to see him. We got to see him for three hours. Now, mind you, this is from July. And this at this point now we're in March. It was March. So we had gotten to see him a couple times that since, since we're fighting for him in court. And then she hit him again, started playing that game again, even though we had made an agreement. Found him, got to see him for three hours, and he, um, my sister and I were sitting with him. He, he, he knew who we were. He said he loved you multiple times. He, he talked to my brother on Skype in Singapore. He talked to his brother on the phone, and he could say little words here and there, but he actually looked good. 
And then we found out that the four months he was there, there were no visitors except a housekeeper. His wife or daughter never visited him. So as we're crying and begging and saying, please let us see our dad. They're, not, was, they're not even seeing him. Mm-mm. They're isolating him. Well, the worst story was the fact that at the end, I know she took him on a freaking road trip. Yeah. Like a vacation. Once we got the visitation rights and we got in to see him, she ripped him out at 2.30 that night, 2.30 in the morning, against doctor's orders, against nurse's orders, against the nurses begging her not to take him, that he was very sick and he he needed to be transported by ambulance on a special mattress um, to another facility or with another doctor. She and she was supposed to sign him out. She wouldn't sign him out. She wouldn't do anything. She took my da- my dad, put him in a wheelchair with all of his equipment attached, rolled him out of there. This is with another caretaker. Threw him in the back of an SUV at two thirty. Two thirty in the morning. Threw him back in an SUV. Didn't get in that SUV. Got in an SUV with her boyfriend behind there. Now this is all on videotape. It's all on videotape. And then proceeded. Do you have the video? The police do. So, and proceeded to take him to her house. We were alerted the next day. Um, We... Does she get financial gain out of his death or what? What's the deal? This is... I I don't know why. I don't know why people do... I don't know why people do crazy stuff, but three weeks later, he was dead. So, the reason I got temporary conservatorship was the doctor that was caring for him wrote a letter to the court saying what she did to... Her husband, what Jean Thompson Kaysen did to Casey Kaysen was put him in harm's way and could kill him. And the judge gave me conservatorship and then we had to find my dad because she had, she took him to Vegas. By the time she got to Vegas, the caretaker that was with him, a nurse, there was blood in his, um, in his bag. He had his, her back had ripped open. He was coughing. There was no doctor for five days with him. He was not on, you know, he, she was dumping and shore down his feeding tube. So he was dehydrated. He was sick. He had no pain meds and no medication. So she took him to Vegas. The the the, the caretaker flees, leaves because she's scared, scared to death. And she goes to the police. So then from there, she decides, oh, let's get him into Washington. Because her plan was to get him to a um, to an Indian reservation and then out of the country. We found the Indian reservation. We found it because her own nephew called me and said, this is what she's planning to do. You got to stop her. Wow. So we found that out to Wallopy, um, stopped that. And she found somebody in, in Washington she knew when she was 10 years old, called her up and said, hey, we're, we're on a vacation. We want to come and see you. And they said, okay. So she flies And in they there. brought him there? Oh, yeah. They bring him there. It's so bad that the ambulance driver that picks them up calls Adult Protective Services. That's how we found him in Washington. Wow. But it was too late. By the time I went up there with my conservatorship, fought in the court for two weeks. So she kidnapped him, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, When we got him to the hospital, we did everything we could to save him. I mean, we we did everything. And uh, and it was too late. No matter what we did, his body was shutting down and his lungs were filling up with liquid. And so we we took him off the, the hydration. He started to get better. And we're like, okay. And the doctor said, it's futile. What's happening to him is he's shutting down. The minute you put him back on hydration, it's going to fill up his lungs. I said, but let's try it. I mean, maybe he's getting better. And we put him back on the hydration and he started to choke to death. And it was probably the worst thing I've, I've ever heard, seen, and experienced in my entire life. It was, it, was, it was horrible. And then his feeding tube backed up. He was no longer digesting. And the doctor explained, and my sister explained to me, that when a body dies, you don't want to eat. You don't want to drink. That's You're not thirsty anymore. There's nothing. The body is shutting down. Like with animals. They go into a corner and they kind of just crawl up and die. You can put food and water in front of them. They don't want it. Right. And that's the same with human bodies. So we did everything we could to save him. And um, and he 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 died. Um, and there's a lot more to the story. There's so much more that went on. And, and his wife not visiting when she had. We went to court and the judge said, you both can visit. You both have the right to be there. And I hope she said, goes to jail. So do I. I think she deserved to be in jail, and I think that's almost like murder in a way, by neglect, right? You're dead on. I mean, it's just that's how I see it, and that's why I went when she when that happened. I went and I filed charges. I said, look, you know, I said this is they they had to take a police report. I said this is what happened. Here's the note from the doctor. He said she could kill him. He's now dead. What is that? If that's not elder abuse. What is it? And they agreed with me, and then now it's sat. It just sits. Right. You know? 
So they transferred it around, and then she also took her his body and sent it to what? Um, well, after he, my dad died, he... Um, by the way, I just wanted to say I wanted to give you my condolences. I know it's been oh. a little while, but oh, no, thank I'm so you. sorry that you had to go through that. Thank you. appreciate it. But you know what? There's, th- I'm doing what my dad would have done, taken a horrible, tragic situation and help so many other people that are going through the same thing so they huh? don't have to go through this. Yeah, that and shouldn't have even be possible for it's that It's happening happen. to so many people. I, I Every single day I receive letters saying, this is what's happening to me, here's my story. Every single day. And my foundation, Kasem Cares Foundation, you can find it online. So if anybody's going through this or watching this and they're like, this is what's happening to me. You know, if you go to CasemCaresFoundation.org or CasemCares.com or any form of Kasem Cares Foundation, you're going to get there. Um, anyway, so p- I, people find me all the time and say, this is what's going on. So I decided in the midst of fighting for my dad to create and to, or to have beg somebody to like author a bill that would stop this, that would stop the isolation and abuse of elders. And what I've dubbed it the visitation bill, Assemblyman Mike Gatto heard me on the radio, saw me on TV shows and said, I want to help you. I'm going to help you do this. My stepfather Robert Naylor is a lobbyist and a lawyer. And he said, I'm going to be your lobbyist. Wow. So I had my team and uh, Troy Martin, my one of my lawyers, said, I'll help you write this. So we all kind of got together and Mike Gatto authored it with, with um, Robert Naylor, my lobbyist, my stepdad, and my, my, my lawyer, Troy Martin. And then we have this great bill. And what it what does... What is the name of the bill? Um, it's AB 2034 out here. I call it the visitation bill. Okay. We now have it in five different states. Fantastic. So hopefully it'll all get passed. But um, I'm not going to stop until it's in all 50 states. And this is what it does. Because people say, well, what if you know, what if they're bad kids? Or what if they don't want to see them? It doesn't automatically give you visitation rights. But what it does do is allow, allow a judge to rule on visitation. So right now, when we went to court, my dad said, I want to see my kids. I want to see my kids. I want... She couldn't say, okay... Here's your visitation schedule. She said to both of us, we're sitting there in court, go figure it out. Thank you, judge. If we could figure it out, we wouldn't be here. So and that's why that's the, why Jean Kasem, I even don't like using that, Jean Thompson Kasem, she reneged on all of the agreements that were made. I knew that would happen. She's done that multiple times. She does not tell the truth. So I'm like, she's gonna agree to this and it's gonna go to pot. But if it would have been Because it's not enforceable, right? Right. If it would have been court-ordered, it would have been for, enforceable, you know? So, yeah. enforced. So, what happened... It makes sense. You have that with children. Why not have that with right. older elders? That's right. So, what the bill does is allow a judge to rule on visitation. They send a court-appointed doctor or lawyer to the ailing loved one. And they say, do you want to see your kids? Yes. Okay, we're going to set up a visitation schedule. No. That's it. No. If the person's incapacitated, you look at the child parent history of visitation or the sibling history of visitation and you rule on that. It is that simple. There's no money, there's no estate, there's no will, there's no trust, there's nothing involved. Because right now you have to go for a guardianship slash conservatorship um, or you have to go for a durable power of health. You're looking at a hundred or three hundred thousand oh dollars, six God. months to a year in court where Most... that person could be dead. Nobody has that kind of money. No. And you usually don't get a conservatorship over a spouse. The only reason I won is because she put my my father's he, life in danger, and eventually he died. But she did that, and the judge saw that and said, "Okay, I wow. believe she is not acting in her husband's best interest." The doctor said that. The lawyer said that. The judge said that. I mean, yeah, it it's was obvious. It was, a, it it's was pretty a, yeah. obvious. Well, I, um, I'm sure she will be someday in jail, and I. I, I'm going to be following all of your, you know, activities on this, and I definitely, you know, support what you're doing, and I think that it's really important for everyone else as well, and that you've taken something so terrible and turned it into something good. And I think that's fantastic that what Thank you're doing. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, and you know, didn't you go to um, where was it that you went? You went and spoke on on behalf of the bill, didn't you? Yeah, well, I speak. I'm I'm, I'm constantly lobbying in Sacramento, so okay. I'm up there talking to politicians and. I'm now in different states and I'm talking to different people getting the bill everywhere. But it takes a lot of money to get a bill passed. And I can't be the only one up there. I can't what do you be need there. To- I mean, it costs a lot of money. And so, and, and, and this is what's frustrating is people get online and they'll read about me and, and there's sites that say I'm worth $20 million. I'm like, oh gosh, if I was worth $20 million, I wouldn't ask anybody for money, you know? I make a good living. Um, I'm very successful. So is my sister. So is my brother. The reason why we're successful is our father didn't give us everything. 
people that they've been handed money or they've been handed, they don't work hard. We all have work ethic because when we asked our dad for something, his answer was get a job, go get a job. You'll have self-esteem. You'll feel better about yourself. You'll care about the things you, when you buy something, you'll care about it. It's so true. When you're given stuff, there's nothing, you, you don't feel good about yourself. So when we were, you know, we heard this on, you know, my stepmother saying we were estranged from him. We borrowed money from him. It first went from hundreds of thousands of dollars to $3 million. So I said to the court, you can have a forensic audit of my entire bank account. See if any of that money ever came in there. That kind of shut that down. And then the fact that we've She's been in court. She's just making stuff up. I'm making stuff up. She called me a porn star. Ew. Oh, no, no. She called me a porn star. She's like, there's proof. So when she actually got asked about that and said, well, what are you talking about? Where's the proof? She did Maxim magazine. Oh. <laughs> wow that is it was pornography just yeah but it was it was lies after lies. you know and, and my sister and brother didn't want to deal with that and didn't want to hear about was, themselves in the news and i said bring it on because there's nothing you can do to stop me from fighting for my dad there is nothing you could say about me yeah because it's all lies and eventually that will all come out and it yeah. did and, and we've been in court for a year and a half we've never asked for money we've never asked for the estate we've never asked for anything except to see my dad. And now I'm asking for justice to be served. Good. And it will be one way or another. Yes, I believe it. That. I believe it. I agree. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, I really wanted, you know, just get everybody to go and check out your Carrie Kasem site. Thank you. And follow you and support you. And I mean, also Carrie is in her, in her own right as a, it's a radio personality and you also have done different interviews on TV and lots of things like that. So yeah, I've been, I mean, I've been in radio since 97. Yeah. You know, I quit my syndicated talk radio show. The one with Nikki Six, right? Yep. I was on that for four and a half years. We were at the top of our game. Wow. And I quit that to go fight for my dad because if I, yeah, I wouldn't have ever have seen my dad again if I wouldn't have. So I, I don't regret it for a second, but I had a career before my dad died. A lot of people don't see that. And I'm like, check me out. I've no, been on, yeah. I've been working for 20 years. This isn't, you know, like a fly by night. All of a sudden my dad dies and I'm working. That's not it. No. In fact, I was working more and making more money before, before that happened. Yeah. So um, you know, but I'm on purpose now and I feel like with this foundation, I have found something to, to fight for and for, and, and, and people, they desperately need, you know, change because we're all going to get old and these laws aren't protecting us. Yeah. This could happen to anybody. And so, you know, I think that our culture really needs to value our elders a lot more than they do. I mean, right now it's the focus so much is on being young and young people and all that sort of thing. But really, the, those people are, have so much lack of experience and lack of understanding but of But they're all going to get old too. Yeah. And they think they're not. And you think you're, you know, there's, it, when you're that young, you never think, oh, you know, I'm going to get old. Oh, I'm going to die. You really don't. You don't have the mortality thing doesn't kick in, you know? Yeah. So I, I feel like when it has been done to you and when you, when, when you either have a father or a grandfather or a mom, a grandmother that's been abused, either whether it's in a um, convalescent home, whether it's by a guardian that's or a their whole own other thing yeah, too. parents, but that's what this foundation is going to do. It's going to change the laws to protect, you know, the elderly because we're all going to be there. We're all going to be there and we can be taken advantage of by anyone who calls themselves a caretaker whether it's a husband or wife or um, somebody who's just a nurse yeah. or somebody who's a friend. You can, you can be taken advantage of, you can be abused financially and physically. And there are, you know, you see people that make their wills and estate plans when they're completely healthy and in the right mind. The second they start to, you know, their, their Alzheimer's kicks in or the dementia or something, something happens, a caretaker can come in Having on a good day where they seem like they're good, right in front of a lawyer, sign away everything to them. And it happens every single day. We talk about this all the time. We talk about it's how important it is to get your, your will, your trust, your estate plan in order. You know, even though it can be changed, I say videotape it. Videotape everything. And if, if somebody wants to see their kids and thinks, even for a second, that their wife or somebody or caretaker may, you know, um, block them or may isolate it's so No one important. would ever think that though. That's the crazy you thing. You don't think it, put it on tape. I don't care. Look in the camera and say, I want to see my kids. This is what I want to go to my kids. This is what I want in my will and estate plans. And if anybody changes it, then I have dementia or I am sick. That is what you need to say. And it may not hold up in court, but it's going to give you a better shot. And I'm, I want to create a law that if somebody has all of their, um, 
their, their trust, their estate plan, their will in order, and somebody wants to challenge it and change it, and I want to see all the people that are in that will, all the people that, um, that, that created the will together with the new team, and I want that person to be evaluated. I, want that, I don't want it to just take a couple hours. It should be a few days. Let's see if that person changes his mind. Are they in the right mind? Because when you have dementia, you can have good days and bad days, but you can still be manipulated, especially by a caretaker. Because yeah. that person could be very scared they're going to be left alone. Totally. But yet they want to see their children. But the, the children know something is going on, whether it's physical abuse or financial abuse. So I want to change some laws so it's stricter and this abuse doesn't happen because it's happening every single day. It's horrible. Um, so that's kind of like my life's goal is to, yeah, is to get this bill in every, in every state and to change some laws so when I get older, this doesn't happen to me. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm just so amazed by you and by everything that you're doing. And I really, really think that it's amazing. And also this happens to be uh, Women's History Month right now. Oh, look at that. So, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can do and go out there and like make a huge difference. And I think the fact that I think we care also so much, you know, like when you're telling me the story, it makes me just have so many emotions. And I think that that we can do a lot for people, but we can do we a can. lot to change. We can. Yeah. And life is about helping people. It really is about helping people. That is so important. And um, it's funny, I mean, the last few years of my life before this happened, I kept saying, I wanna do something that's gonna help a lot of people. Yeah. I wanna change the world somehow. And I really wanted to, and I didn't know this was coming. And I wish it wouldn't have, but it's here, and I've gotta do something good with it. And now that I can help, I'm going to. So no doubt about thanks that. Thanks for letting me spread the word and, and you know, spread awareness to elder abuse and what's going on. But um, I'll just yeah. tell you right now, if this is happening to you, please, write me at caseandcaresfoundation.com or .org. I get every single piece of mail. I do respond if it takes a little bit of time. You know, just hang on, I will get to you. Um, I also have a team of lawyers that help, but this bill needs support. So go on, give us your email. If you cannot donate, that's okay. Lend your email support. That is very important. If you can donate, please do. Um, Hopefully you know, we can make it into a federal bill, right? We can't do federal because it's a probate. It's okay. pro it's probate, meaning that it's a it's a fa it's in family it's a family kind of uh, code. Okay. We can't do federal. I wish it was. It would have been oh, so much easier. I know. I know. I know. So, okay. Yeah. Well, cool. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for coming on the show. No, you're thank you. Amazing. You are amazing. Yes. You're you're incredible. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes. yes thank you. For sure. Thank you so much for watching Carrie Kasem on and Kimberly Quigley on the Red Booth.